today on Let the Bible Speak. Coming up in our study today, God's Bottle of Tears. That's next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. And a good day to you. Thank you for joining me for our Bible study together. Our scripture reading in a moment will come from the Psalms. Despite the joys that life could bring, life is also full of tears. We're sometimes embarrassed by our tears. Maybe we feel it shows weakness or vulnerability. But all of us cry from time to time. It's a very abnormal thing for a person to never be moved to tears. They're a universal language, and they have been since the creation of mankind. Crying is an expression of sadness, hurt, or anger, and yes, sometimes of great happiness. Tears can also provide relief and release from the emotions that are pent up inside of us. And there are some who are easily moved to tears. Others are stoic, and they're able to hold back the urge to cry, but nearly every person cries from time to time. Well, there's a wonderful statement in the psalm that I want to talk to you about today, Psalm 56. And this statement should comfort Christians when we find ourselves in times of anxiety, sorrow, and grief. And there's much of that in our world today. You may be going through very difficult times in your life right now. You may be feeling a great sense of anxiety over the circumstances of our world or individual circumstances within your life. I want you to listen to what David wrote thousands of years ago in Psalm 56 and verse 8. He says, Thou tellest my wanderings, Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Why did David write this? And what did he mean? What should we learn from David's plea of long ago? Well, today I want to talk to you about God's bottle of tears. So stay right there. David experienced many joys and triumphs in his life, but he also spent many a day and night in the valley of the shadow. This great man of God had many reasons throughout his life to weep, and the Bible tells us of the many times that he shed hot and bitter tears. Despite his great faith, despite his victories in battle, there were times when David was afraid and anxious. There were days when he felt betrayed by friends and family. 
He suffered the crushing blow of losing children to the hand of death, and remorse over his own sins nearly destroyed him emotionally and physically. Many of the Psalms were born out of these dark times in David's life, and they reflect a broken and grief-stricken man and father who was reaching out to God in his distress and seeking comfort from above. But David's sorrows began when he was a young man, as a young shepherd. It was then he went through one of the darkest periods of his life. When he stepped out and volunteered to battle the taunting Philistine giant Goliath, and with a shepherd's sling and a handful of stones toppled the giant foe, well, he became Israel's rising star. When he was presented to King Saul, the Bible says that Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and in the sight of Saul's servants. And so from town to town, David's fame quickly spread until they were singing in the streets, Saul may have slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Well, Saul was not so carried away with David's newfound popularity. He was a very proud and egotistical man. He burned with jealousy and insecurity. From that day forward, the Bible says that Saul set his eye on David and tried to kill him. And this introduced a terrible period in David's life. For some time he became a fugitive, and he fled to the wilderness where he was relentlessly pursued by Saul. Well, those were dark times for David as he hid in the mountains and in caves and lived like a hunted animal. And at one point he fled to the king of Gath in the enemy territory of the Philistines and was apparently held there until he finally escaped and went to Adullam. Well, those were stressful and fearful times for this young man. And as I say, some of the Psalms were born out of this period in his life. And Psalm 56, our text, is one of them. The heading or the superscription of this psalm claims that this is a psalm of David when the Philistines took him in Gath. Now these superscriptions were not written by inspiration like the psalm itself was, but they do go back hundreds of years before Christ, and they even predate the Greek, Greek Septuagint. And it's certainly not difficult to imagine this psalm relating to the time that the superscription describes for David's pitiful plea depicts him as being under the attack of fierce enemies, being surrounded by armies, and he never had an army any fiercer and more unrelenting than Saul was. And so he says in this psalm, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O Thou Most High. What time I am afraid, I will trust in Thee. In God I will praise His word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. So you can see how this psalm could have been born out of this traumatic time in David's life as he was being pursued by the armies of Saul. And as he fled for his life, he was feeling the emotions of fear and depression, abandonment, betrayal, and uncertainty. And how many tears he wiped from his eyes during this dark time, we do not know, but God knew. For David took comfort in these words recorded in verse 8. Thou tellest my wanderings. In other words, God was watching as David fled from place to place, from hill to hill, and from cave to cave. He then says, Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? What a powerful plea this is. It's a statement that's brimming with consolation and peace in the midst of a terrible storm. He asked God to put his tears in a bottle to treasure them up as people do precious and costly ointments and perfumes. David found solace in the fact that God saw his tears and made a note of every tear that fell from his eyes. And the Bible indeed teaches that God does see the tears and he hears the cries of his faithful people. You may recall how 2 Kings chapter 20 tells how the good king Hezekiah became gravely ill and the prophet Isaiah came to see him and told him that God said he needed to set his house in order because he would soon die. But Hezekiah had unfinished business, and the Bible says that he turned his face to the wall and he pleaded with the Lord to spare his life, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore, the Bible says. 
Isaiah had barely left the room when the voice of God came to him and told him to go back and tell Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day shalt thou go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy, day, thy days fifteen years, and will deliver thee and this city. You know, it's a wonderful thought to think that the Christian has a heavenly Father who sees, hears, knows, and understands our sorrows. In a world that's filled with such loneliness and isolation, the Christian is never alone. The Christian is never unattended. The Christian never goes without one who cares about him and who sympathizes with the plight that he suffers in this life. The psalmist said in Psalm 103 and verse 13, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. You know, a good parent feels the hurt of their children. Even when we cannot take the pain or the disappointment away, well, their tears break our hearts too. And thus the Bible says that it's that way with God, our Heavenly Father. Sometimes it's easy to think of God as a faraway being with little interest in the day-to-day -day events of our lives. Oh, perhaps we can see Him concerning Himself with world-changing affairs, with His eye upon the kings and princes and presidents and governors of this world, and keeping His sovereign hand perhaps on the wheel of human affairs as a whole. But isn't it harder to imagine Him looking into our room at night and hearing us silently weep or seeing the tear that escapes our eye? when sadness sweeps over us. But the Bible shows us that He does see those tears, and He does care. You know, to my knowledge, the Bible never tells us that God Himself cries or weeps, but it does show that God feels, and He has many of the same emotions that we do. Uh, God is in complete control of His emotions. He is never overwhelmed by and directed by His emotions. But he reveals himself in his word as a being that expresses various emotions. For example, he has sorrow when we rebel against him. Genesis 6 and verse 6 says that God regretted making man and it grieved him in his heart. God hates wickedness according to Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. He becomes jealous when his people turn from him to idols and worldliness. So says Joshua chapter 24 verse 19. He can be provoked to anger according to Isaiah chapter 65, verses 1 through 3. But on the other hand, the Bible also teaches that God is made happy and He rejoices over His children. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in His love. He will joy over thee with singing. And in the same way, the Bible reminds us that God has great compassion for His people. Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Joel chapter 2, verse 13 says, Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And the Bible shows beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is intimately aware of the most minute details moment by moment within our life. God is outside of linear time. God is able to see the beginning and the end. He is able to see from eternity to eternity at one time. He's not a human being like we are. Job 31 and verse 4 says, Does he not see my ways and number all of my steps? The Savior reminded us so beautifully in Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Now you see, if God marks the flight and the fall of a tiny sparrow, you can be assured He knows about the storms that rage in your heart and He knows about the sorrows and the losses that you experience from day to day. God in heaven is not subject to the same things we are here on earth, and He may, he may not identify with all of our sufferings from His throne in heaven, but He does identify with them through His Son. You see, God became a man in the form of His Son, Christ Jesus, who consequently experienced all of the things that we experience in life except for committing sin. 
The Bible says he knew or did know sin, but he did come into a world under the curse of sin. And as the Son of Man, he was subjected to sorrow. He grappled with grief. He keenly felt the sting of death. He knew what it was to be betrayed by friends and be pursued by enemies. He knew what it was to be cursed and who it was, how it was to be talked about and railed against and falsely accused and represented. He knew what it was to suffer physical pain. No pain was ever felt by any human any more than the cross that Jesus endured. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 shows us that he felt the full spectrum of human emotions that we feel. The writer says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. One translation says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Now to, to empathize means to put oneself in another person's position, to feel what they are feeling. We sometimes use the word sympathize. And basically that implies that we come alongside someone else and at the same time with them we offer emotional support. We grieve with them. We support them. You know, that's one of the greatest comforts that we receive in life from others. It's wonderful when tragedy befalls our lives or when we're going through difficult times to have people to offer their assistance in whatever way they can help. It's a wonderful comfort to know that people are standing by and ready to do whatever they can and just to express their sorrow and their condolences on our behalf. But isn't there something more powerful when a friend can identify with our suffering? I mean, people mean well when they express condolences and offer to help, but there's a special bond and a special kind of help that comes from someone who has walked the same path we are walking. When someone could put their arm around you and say, I know what it's like to lose a child, or I know how it feels to be sick or to have cancer. I know the loss of seeing your house destroyed by a fire. But you see, God is able to identify with every feeling of loss, sorrow, betrayal, pain, deprivation in the person and in the earthly experiences of His Son, Christ Jesus. And consequently, the Gospels record a number of occasions when Jesus Himself shed tears. When His good friend Lazarus got sick and died, Jesus went to be with the family at their home in Bethany. And when he beheld their grief and bewilderment, the Bible says in that famously short but oh so profound verse in John 11 verse 35 that Jesus wept. These were tears of sympathy. He wasn't weeping because Lazarus had died, for Jesus knew he had come to that place to raise Lazarus from the dead. Or perhaps he pitied the family and their simple limited understanding of death at that point, but I rather think that Jesus was himself moved. He was touched by their grief and he grieved along with them. He cared about the pain and the heartache that they were feeling, and he wept with them. And then at the close of his ministry, as he made his descent to Jerusalem for the final week, he stopped on the Mount of Olives, and he looked down at the golden, glistening, rising city of David with its majestic temple and its cobblestone streets congested with lost and blinded souls quickly traveling on their way to judgment on a Christless eternity. And the Bible says in Luke 19, verse 41, that when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. And the original word, the original language there means that Jesus was so overcome with grief that he wept with convulsive sobs. And the night before he went to the cross, he wept alone in the Garden of Gethsemane, dreading the pain and the suffering that was waiting him with the rising of the sun. And the writer in Hebrews 5 and verse 7 says that he offered up prayers and supplications to his heavenly Father with strong crying and tears, and that he was heard. Now God in heaven doesn't need to weep as we do because he sees the beginning and the end of every situation, and unlike us, he meets every difficulty and problem with an infinite understanding and infinite power and wisdom but Jesus did say that He came to show us or reveal to us in a way that we could somewhat understand the Father whom we don't comprehend. And Jesus, as the Son of Man and the Son of God, made that connection between the human and the divine, 
And he exemplified the feelings and the concern that God yet has for us. He does understand our problems. He does understand the grief of his, uh, of his children. He does see when his children cry and he cares about our troubles. He cares about our woes. He is deeply moved by our heartache. David prayed, God, put my tears in your bottle for they are written in your book. Now, maybe you, like David, feel frightened by some stressful and uncertain circumstance that you're in. God sees your tears. Maybe you, like David, feel as though the world is closing in around you and you're trapped in a place <clears throat> that you don't know how to escape from. God sees your tears. Maybe, like Hezekiah, you're afraid for your health. You're waiting this week on that dreaded call from the doctor, that test result, or you're facing a battery of treatments that you don't know how it will all turn out. God sees your tears. Maybe like Jesus, you weep over someone who is lost in sin, a child, a spouse, a friend, and oh, it hurts to see them throw their soul away. Well, Jesus knows all about that. He wept too. God saw his tears. He sees yours. Maybe like our Lord, you weep over a newly made grave. Maybe you've lost the dearest person on earth to you. And you know there'll be a resurrection, but it still hurts to let them go for a while. Jesus weeps with you, just as he did his loved ones in Bethany so long ago. And God in heaven loves and or knows rather and sees your tears. And David wanted to imagine that God saves those tears, that he puts them in his bottle, that he makes note of them, he records them. Why would he do that? Because our tears mean something to him. The tears of his children means something to him. He makes note of everything that brings a tear of sorrow to the eye of one of his saved children. And one day, he has promised to turn those tears to pearls of rejoicing. Oh, we may live in a world of suffering and a world cursed by sin today, but there's coming a world where those, those things will not be. And when John the Revelator saw that panoramic picture of the great after a while, and he saw the redeemed strolling the golden street of the New Jerusalem, he said in Revelation 21 and 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Yes, beyond this veil of tears there is a happier tomorrow for the Christian Beyond the suffering of this life, there is the eternal crown of rejoicing for the faithful Christian. But for the one that does not know Christ, this sorrowful and sinful life will end in judgment and eternal regret and an everlasting home in the caverns of the doom where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, the Bible says. In Christ there's comfort, peace, and hope. And I hope today that you'll come to Him for the comfort only He can give. Come
Want to see today's study again? Watch Let the Bible Speak anytime, even on the go, on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Go to letthebiblespeak.tv and also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Well, as always, it's been a joy to be with you today to study the Bible. Thank you for joining me. If you would like a copy of our sermon, we'll be happy to send it. Ask for it by the title, God's Bottle of Tears, and that free transcript will be on its way. You can also find past broadcasts and transcripts at our website, ltbstv.org. And you can find us on social media. We're on YouTube. We have a podcast you can subscribe to. Just search for Let the Bible Speak TV and be sure to follow us on those various platforms. I hope that you'll spread the word about Let the Bible Speak. Tell your friends and neighbors to watch next time, won't you? And make your plans to join me back here if the Lord wills for another time of Bible study together. Until then, I pray you have a wonderful week ahead and may God richly bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.